So it is amazing to me that when you become a parent, how you learn to give a look. There's an anointing that comes on you when you have those children to where you're able to give a certain look that communicates so much to that child without a word being spoken. Now, that's when you stumble, you do something questionable. You get the look. If I did something wrong and my mom was there, she would spank me with whatever she grabbed first <laughs> on whatever part of my body she could get to the fastest. So it could be a paint stir stick. It could be a wooden spoon. It could be a shoe. That was mom. The words that would bring holy fear into me as a little boy, and I was very active. I'll just say that. I was active. I was the kid who my parents would look at and go, Scott, someday you're going to make thousands of people laugh, but for right now, take this pill. <laughs> I was active. And the words that would bring fear into my heart above all else was hearing these words, get the belt. Some of y'all just then, you kind of tightened up just for a moment. I, I, I can so remember this one time, my dad had built me a go-kart, pull string go-kart, and this thing was fast too. And I would take that go-kart and I would just drive it around our house. And I had driven this go-kart so much in the backyard that the backyard was almost just pure dirt. It was just a big dust pile. And I would ride that go-kart. So this one evening, good news, bad news. This one evening, good news, I went outside, third grade, started my go-kart, just start riding. Good news, I'm a boy having a blast. I'm going around the house, I'm kicking up dust, man, sweat's coming down my head. Bad news. An hour before, my mom had just got me out of the shower and dressed me because we were going out to an event with my parents. So when my dad walks outside, because my dad had a thing about summer months of, you know, Texas, he'd start the car, get it cool for my mom. So when my dad walked outside after I had been showered and cleaned up to go to this event with my parents and sees me on the go-kart covered in dust, I kid you not, even though I got an engine right behind me blaring loud, I still could hear the words, get my belt. Now, many of us have heard that term, get my belt, and it brings fear. I, I hope to do this today. Today, I hope that we might be able to change, we might be able to alter that emotion to something different today. Because today, we're actually going to talk about the belt of truth. Inside of Scripture, right? We're going to talk about the belt of truth. And in the past where you would hear somebody say, get the belt, fear would cause, you know, stir up inside of you. My hope this morning is that we as a church people understanding the belt of truth, that we would be a people that would call out, get the belt. Get the belt. I'm going to ask you guys if you would today, man, take out your Bibles. You guys got your Bibles with you? Hold them up real quick. You got those? You got those? All across the room? Hold them up. Hold them up. Good, 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 good. Turn over. I'm going to take you over to two places today. We're going back over to the Ephesians chapter 6 passage. We've been there. But then I'm also going to have you return to another one of the places that we were at two weeks ago, and that was in 2 Kings. So I'm going to invite you guys, if you would, to turn over to, uh, to Ephesians chapter 6 and then to um, 2 Kings chapter 6. All right, so those are the two places. So while you're turning there, again, man, we're glad you're here today. Can I tell you that? We, we are glad that you are here today. And first time here at Lake Country, welcome. We're so glad to have you. Uh, man, I just need to do a, a quick introduction. So we got a youth pastor. 
And we, <laughs> we, have been, we have been praying and we have been waiting. And they, man, they are here. And I want to introduce to y'all today uh, Bradley and Caroline Blaylock. Man, you got to stand up just real quick so they can see y'all, man. I, I need them to see y'all's pretty face. And we are, we are so glad to have these guys here with us. They just bought a house, man, just right down the road, so they're close here at the church. And uh, we're actually going to share a few things that are going to be taking place with youth ministry at the end of the service today. But, man, we're so glad to have you guys. Upton's over in the, man, little blonde hair dude, just cute as all get out. You will see Upton over there as well. And apparently he's adjusting well already. Well, sure, he's in Texas. Why not? So anyway, we are. We're so glad to have you guys here big time. Um, you know, when we talk about the belt of truth, the, the reality is, is that we need to be a church that's going to get the belt. We need to be a people saying, get the belt. Why? Because now more than ever, we need truth. Amen. Today, we've got lies that we're bombarded with. We have lies coming from our leadership in Washington. No matter which side of the aisle you're sitting on, there's lies coming at us left and right. Amen? There's, there's lies coming at us. We need the build of truth. Inside of the science world and inside of academia, there's so much deception that is coming forth. We need get the belt of truth. We've got people that are spewing lies and deception, and here's the deal. They don't even know it. They're speaking things, and they're preaching, telling us, you need to adhere to this. This is truth, and the reality is they're off the mark. So now more than ever, we, we need truth. And the truth is, my friends, is that God is saying, I desire you to be able to know that. I desire for you to be able to have truth and accept that. And so when we talk about, when we talk about the, the, the belt, all right, in, in, in the belt, the times that I wear a belt, you know, I just don't wear a belt that much now. But when I do wear a belt, it's because I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready, man. I'm ready to go out. And when I'm putting the belt on, it's because, man, I'm finishing everything. I've, I've got the pants on. i got the shirt. The shirt's now tucked in, shoes on. I put the belt on. When the belt is on, that means I'm ready to go. Now, for the Roman soldier, Roman soldier would have a different kind of belt. He'd have more of a, a, a utility belt taking place. And, and with the Roman soldier, when the Roman soldier wore the belt, you know, you could look at a Roman soldier, and you could be impressed with all the things they were carrying, right? They'd have their sword. You're like, that's great. And we're going to talk about that next week. There'd be that big old monster shield that they would have. Pastor Santos is going to be with us in a couple of weeks. He's going to be teaching on the shield of faith. Of course, there would be the helmet that would be so impressive. You would see all these things on the Roman soldier, but the thing is you probably would miss this. But the reality is this is one of the most important things. In fact, when we read the scripture that we're about to look at in Ephesians chapter 6, the very first piece of armor that scripture tells us to put on is this. It's not as flashy but it's needed. Why? It keeps the whole thing together. You see, really, the, the, the simple reality is this, is that when someone was wearing the belt, the belt of truth taking place here, the belt, what it did was it, it held all the different pieces together. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you this, in reality and truth, all the different pieces of the armor, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, all those different things, my friends, if we don't have truth, then those other things are ineffective. We're using them ineffectively. You see, the, the, the reality is if you don't have truth about salvation, your helmet is ineffective. If you sit here and you think, well, Scott, I can work like some, some religions will teach. If I work hard enough, I can be good enough to have salvation. That's not truth. The scripture says this, the scripture says your best works, our best works before God are like filthy rags. Whoa, anybody catch that? 
Well, Scott, I was working hard. Guess what? You can't work hard enough. Well, Scott, that puts us in a bad place. The truth is it does. But the truth, it, but the truth is, is that salvation is a gift from God. It's grace, all right? So there's truth. So that helmet has got to rely on truth. The sword. If I don't, if I don't use the sword in truth, then it could be damaging. I saw this a lot as a kid, just going to say. But can I tell you something about my dad? This was never abused. You with me? It's never abused. Sad thing is, is that many times in churches, this is. Literally sat down with a lady talking to her in our office this week. She came from a church from out of state, and in, I asked her about the church that she was a part of. Her first words out of her mouth, it was a cult. And what takes place there is people will take leadership inside of churches, will take the belt of truth, and they'll say, well, this is what the Word of God says, and abuse its people. That's not what this is for. And in fact, if, if, if you read in the papers this last week or, or some of the podcasts, whatever, uh, there was another, they're out of state, there was another church senior pastor abusing a 16-year-old girl for years and years, and the way that he kept her confined was with this. He kept speaking scripture to her, telling her, well, this is truth. And so she didn't come forward. And so instead of this being something to correct, instead of this being something that holds everything together, this became a, an abusive situation. And that's not what this is for. So when we look at the word of God and we, we, we see the belt of truth being put on. We see the belt holding all of these different things together. The Roman soldier would have it. And it's not flashy, but it held everything together. And Paul saw it as such an important thing that it was the very first thing that he said you need to put on. In fact, look there at your scripture in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor. Say full. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the enemy's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full, say full, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, again, we got to hit that. Did y'all see it? It didn't say when, it, I'm sorry, it didn't say if the enemy comes. Are y'all with me? Because you're, listen, we're going to have turmoil. We're going to have difficulties. And we're going to have attacks. The scripture says, when the enemy comes. So that's why we're to put on the full armor of God. So that when, verse 13, therefore put on the full armor. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand Firm, number one, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with your breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of of God. See, in our world today, tell me if I'm missing this. In our world today, we're, we're, everybody's got opinions. Everybody's got a podcast. News is talking about everything and, and, and all kinds of people, whether wise or idiots, everybody is talking and sharing their different opinions of what's taking place. Uh, you know, you'll hear, well, coffee's bad for you. Oh, no, 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 no. New study just came out. So coffee's not that bad for you. Hallelujah. Red meat, red meat's bad for you. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Ah, oh, that report came out. Red meat's good for you. Well, in balance. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we can see how these people talk about medicine or whether they're talking about food. And the different opinions and different studies, they seem to conflict each other. I mean, have we not heard in just the last couple of years, oh, if you will wear a mask... 
you're not going to get COVID. And if you get a mask and get this one shot, COVID's gone. We will, we will see that thing exterminated, falling off the, pla- the face of the planet. I'm not trying to be political. I'm just bringing up the words that we've been hearing. And the, 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 the reality is, is that we've got all these different people that are speaking, telling us what works, but then it seems like the next day it changes already again. So how do we know? How, how, how do we know which one we actually need to be leaning on? Well, let me do this. Let me do this. Let me give you a definition. Can I give you a definition of truth today? Definition here. Truth, that which is true or in accordance with fact or reality. Watch. Truth is an objective standard in which reality is measured. Did you grab that? Okay, seriously, that one's tweetable right there. Truth is an objective standard in which reality is measured. When we say measured, that means it's not changed by popular opinion. Nor is it changed by how you feel. When we talk about that it's the standard, the standard of which reality is measured. That's why if if you have a a plumb line, those of y'all who've done buildings before, you take this string and you got a weight on the end of it. That's a plumb line and it shows you what's true. But Scott, I don't feel like that's true. But what does it say? My grandfather gave me a compass, right? I got a compass, and you look at this thing, I can tell you exactly where due north is. But, Scott, a lot of people say, Scott, that may be your reality of due north. It's not my reality of due north. I'm sorry. The compass says, there's due north. Go to London. Go to London, right? We're seeing the the Queen's big celebration everything. If you were in London and you were walking around, you could look, say, hey, man, what time is it? Oh, it's about 2.15. But, see, this is what you're going to get in London. You're going to get people, they'll look at their watches, but then they're always looking up. They're looking at Big Ben. You know what it is? That's the standard. Well, Scott, I, I spent a lot of money on this watch. I, I, I think it's 215. We'll look up. What does the standard say? The standard says it's 220. But, Scott, <laughs> I don't think you understand. This is an expensive watch. Really? What kind is it? Well, it's a Rolex. Is it really? Well, it's a, it's a Rolex. So. In fact, I could even bring all my friends around, and I could convince them that it's 215. But the reality is we have a standard, and that standard, Big Ben says, no, it's 220. Scott, do we have that kind of standard? Yeah. We don't have a Big Ben, Okay. In in fact, in Colorado and several places throughout the world, we have the atomic clocks. And that is the standard. And you can sit here today and say, it doesn't feel like it. Every time we got time change, right? You got that time change. It's like, oh, what time is it? It's 7 o'clock. It didn't feel like 7 o'clock. Why? Because it looks like midnight outside, right? It doesn't feel this way. But what do you do is you go to that original source and say, what is it? And I can bring all my friends around and we can all discuss it, but the reality is there's a compass. The reality is there's a plumb line. The reality is there's Big Ben and there's an atomic clock to be able to tell us what the actual time is. Truth is an objective standard in which reality is measured. Let me me hit this real quick. I'll move on. The Supreme Court... The Supreme Court is constantly looking for this. And so many times what the Supreme Court does is they will take the original. They'll take the Constitution. They'll take the Declaration. And it's not their job to change it. It's their job to interpret. It's their job to go, what was the original founding fathers looking for? Okay, Scott, so for us, what is, what is that? That's where we go to God. That's where we go to God, the creator of this whole party. 
and we look at the originator. We look at the original and we say, God, you tell us, you direct us because you've got the game plan. So you are the standard, you are the plumb line, you are the compass, you are Big Ben. We are looking at you because you're the original here and we build everything off you, not vice versa. So it's looking at God. You can sit here with a light bulb. Take a light bulb and go, you know what? I'm not really sure <laughs> the purpose of this thing. So I'm going to take it home today, and I'm going to put it in a bowl, and I'm going to cover it with cereal, and then I'm going to crunch it all up. I'm going to put milk on it, rice milk. I'm going to put milk on it. That's going to be breakfast. You abused it. Well, Scott, how do I know the purpose? Go to the creator. When we see mar- Tell me if I'm missing this. When we see marriages being challenged, when we see I'm a boy, I'm a girl, all those things, when we see those things being challenged, what do we need to do? We need to go to truth. We need to go back to the originator. We need to go back to the creator and say, what is the purpose of this? What is the purpose of marriage? What is the purpose of life? What is the purpose of finances? I can go to the ones who created all things. I want you to understand something. God is not trapped by time. God is not sitting here going, it's 1122. No, God has already seen the very beginning of mankind, the very ending of mankind. Are y'all with me? He's seen the whole thing. You and I, we're in this moment, not God. God has seen the whole thing. And seeing the whole thing, what did he do? He had in his heart, his mind, the Word of God. He gave us the Word of God, seeing every bit of it. Have y'all noticed there's not a Bible 2.0? Now, Mormons have tried to convince us of that, hate to tell you, <laughs> it's not it. In fact, the Word of God says this, cursed is the man who adds to or takes away from this book. That's a whole other message. So what I'm saying is God has already seen the beginning of man and the end of man, and what he has done is he's given us the Word of God, and he says, here's truth. Here's truth. So for each of us to be able to realize that when God has told us he's given us truth, Some of the times it's the truth that we can see, but there's more to it. Because we can't be limited. You still got your Bibles, man. Uh, flip them open if, if you want to, but if not, this Second Kings chapter 6 message, we talked about this two weeks ago, and, and, and I just, I felt it on my spirit. I want to bring us back to it real quick. Uh, those of y'all that weren't here with us two weeks ago, let me just, in a nutshell, just give you the quick story. You got a prophet named Elisha, and Elisha's living in the city, and Elisha is getting attacked by this one king. King hates him. Why? Go listen to the message. King is sitting here. He hates Elisha, so king sends his armies to surround Elisha's house. He's got snipers all over the place. He's going to kill Elisha. Elisha has kind of his assistant. His assistant's name is Gehazi. Gehazi, right? There's the name for your next grandchild right there. Gehazi. Gehazi's kind of the serpent. Gehazi, one morning, he wakes up, he goes outside, and he sees sniper rifles everywhere from the king. Little red dots start appearing on Gehazi. Gehazi quickly runs back inside. He tells Elisha, we're going to die. We're going to die. We're going to die. Why? Because Elisha, man, there's, there's soldiers out there, and they're here to kill us. Now, quick question. Was that truth? Were there soldiers out there that came to kill Elijah and, and Gehazi? Were there soldiers out there? Yes. Truth is, yes. The truth is. The level of truth that Gehazi had led him to the emotions that he was experiencing. You with me? Gehazi's inside the house. He's freaking out. Why? Because I see soldiers and they're here to kill us. That is the only reality he has. Stay with me. And it was at that point that Elisha prayed, God, would you open the eyes of the servant? And when that prayer took place, Gehazi walked back outside. Now, were the soldiers of the king, did they disappear? Were they still there? Yes, they were all still there. But Gehazi saw something greater. 
The scripture says that behind the armies of the king were now the armies of God. And they were in chariots of fire. So again, let's go back to Gehazi because this is the Gehazi truth. When Gehazi came in the first time and he saw the king's soldiers and he said, they're here to kill us. The king's soldiers are out there. Was that a lie? Absolutely not. That was his reality from the perspective that he had. Was he lying? Was he lying to Elisha? No. Was he trying to deceive Elisha? No. But that was the only reality he knew. Listen to me. There is a greater reality. There are sermons and there are messages that are being preached to our world as fact. But they only have a partial reality. They have limited understanding of truth you and me you and me here today we can have limited understanding of truth some of us in this room maybe some that are watching online right now maybe you're sitting here going well scott i know truth really explain to me some truth well truth is is that there is a holy god he is a just god and i'm down here and i'm man and i've messed up i know it okay that is truth is it not that's Gehazi truth. You need to know the fuller truth. What do you mean the fuller truth? You're limited in your understanding of truth here. Truth, yes, just God and man down here, but you need to move past Gehazi. You need to move, but God so loved the world that he gave his only son. You need to move to that truth and that understanding. Is it truth that I'm sinful and I'm separated from God? Yes, but is that the end of the story? No. And there are so many that are telling the world and telling us this is reality and you need to accept this is reality, but they got Gehazi message. And they need to be able to have the full truth. And once again, we can ask the question, well, Scott, where does that full truth come from? Go back to the originator. Go back to the one who is the plumb line. Go back to the one who is the compass. Go back to the one who is Big Ben. So I, I, I want to give you this in, in our time here. Let me just do this real quick. Let me give you two things that I want you to be careful of. As, as, as we're here today and as we talk about the belt of truth that holds it all together, let me give you two things that I want you to be careful of. First thing I, I would tell you is this, is emotions. Emotions. You see, we can make our decisions in life based upon emotions that change like Texas weather. And we can base our decisions, we can base our choices in life on how we feel about different things. Somebody can come up to me and say, Scott, I feel like I could jump off this cliff and fly. Okay, well, in a second though, the reality of the law of gravity is about to kick in. And so this person can jump off feeling like, well, Scott, my reality, my reality is I think I can fly. But the truth of the matter is when they jump, it's not going to end up well. So how you feeling now? Let me, let me read this to you. I love this. Sixteen years ago, Merriam-Webster Dictionary they chose the word of the year. Do y'all realize that Webster every year chooses the word of the year? My educators may know that, but uh, yeah, every year Webster picks the word of the year. 16 years ago, they had a difficult time picking out the word of the year because that was the year that words like Google, I mean, seriously, before we, 1981, was anybody Googling anything? But yet that was one of the words up for uh, the award. You had, you had the word terrorism. That word hadn't existed. Uh, insurgency. But the new word chosen and now is in our dictionaries characterizes our human preference to bend the truth to accommodate our desires. The word in Webster's dictionary selected is the word truthiness. 
Look it up. Dictionary.com. The word is truthiness, and it's this. Is the quality of preferring concepts or facts one wishes to be true rather than the concepts or facts known to be true. So my friends, what we've got to be careful of is those emotions because those emotions change like the wind. And that's probably why King David, man after God's own heart, right? That's why King David is going to say these words after he messed up with this girl named Bathsheba and he had her husband killed. He did all these things. There's a great repentive chapter in Psalm chapter 51. Man, you need a time of repentance before God. That's your passage you want to go to. And in it, in Psalms chapter 51, he says these words, create in me a clean heart, O God, and give me a steadfast spirit. Stop. There it is. What is it? He said, give me a steadfast spirit. What does that mean? Consistency. Help me to be steadfast. Why? Because my emotions jack with me. And I tend to think reality is sometimes what I feel. Now, let me say this real quick, real quick about feelings. I'm not against feelings. God created them. Are y'all with me? God created feelings. Feelings are not a bad thing, but listen to me. It's when we allow feelings, we take feelings as fact when they contradict truth. I can have somebody here today come up after the service and say, well, Scott, I, I, feel, like, I feel like it's okay for me to sleep with this other man's wife. But that contradicts what the originator said. That contradicts what truth said. But, Scott, I feel that. Scott, I, I, I feel like it's okay for me to steal things from my office at work because they don't pay me nearly what I'm really worth. I feel like that's okay. That goes against what the plumb line, that goes against what the compass, that goes against what truth actually is. And so can I tell you this real quick about David? So here was David, and David simply said this, God, help me to be steadfast. Well, how you do that? Scott, can you just give me a nugget here? How, how can I start becoming steadfast? Because my emotions, man, they come and go and they change. And yeah. And that's why David said this. He asked the question, Psalm 119. He goes, how can a young man keep his way pure? How can a young man keep his way pure? How can a young man stay on the right path? And then he ends it with this. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. And and then he lands the plane. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. How do we do this? You got to gird yourself up with truth. What is truth? Go hit the word of God. Go hit the word of God. So the first thing that you got to be careful of is this. You got to be careful of emotions because your emotions are going to change. Again, emotions are not a bad thing. But I wonder what I want you to be able to understand is this, is that, my friends, emotions cannot be the complete determining factor, especially when they contradict what God has already said. Second thing, second thing and last thing, the opinions of others. Scott, how, how do I gird myself up with truth? How do I gird myself up with the belt of truth? The things that's going to compete against this is going to be your emotions. Don't really know if I want to do that. Don't know if that's really what I believe. And the other thing that's going to compete is the opinions of others. I promise you there are going to be others who will speak that will challenge what God has said about this belt of truth. In fact, wasn't it Booker T. Washington? He made this statement. A lie doesn't become truth. Wrong does not become right. And evil does not become good just because it is accepted by a majority. Somebody, please. Did you grab? A lie does not become truth. Wrong does not become right. And evil does not become good just because it is accepted by a majority. Watch the news. Another quote that I grabbed, I saw, it says this, when a person or society replaces absolute truth with relative truth, and in parentheses they put truthiness, relative truth will give birth to chaos, 
and left unchecked, chaos will grow into lawlessness, and lawlessness will lead to anarchy. Turn on the news. And we do that. We do that. We, 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 we hear the crowds shout different things, and we think, well, it must be true because why a lot of people are shouting it. Instead, what we've got to be willing to do is, and I'm going to land with this, you've got to be willing to take up the belt of truth, even if it's not popular. Can I remind you something real quick? The Jewish leaders didn't kill Jesus because everything he said was pleasing to them. If you decide to pull up the belt of truth, I promise you it's not always going to be popular. I promise you you're not going to get a million likes on your social media because you spoke truth. So here's something. Here's a commitment that I want to make to you. Here's a commitment I want to make to you. My heart and my desire and even my time is committed to bring truth to this house. That's, that's a commitment that I'm making. Now let me make a promise. So my commitment is I'm striving with everything within me to study, to hear God, to meet with others. I'm doing all these things because I want to bring truth spoken into this house. That's number one. The promise is this. At some point, you are not going to like it. Can I say that? Some of y'all already are going, Scott, you did it today. Good for you. I promise you, as I bring you truth, and listen, listen, I want you to hear something. I'm growing in this. I'm growing in this. If I speak something that doesn't line up with truth, that doesn't line up with the Word of God, then I pray the next week I will be standing before you repenting. Coming before you saying, my bad. I, I, I thought I understood this. That's not the case. I'll be there. But I guarantee I'm going to say things if I'm speaking truth. Because if you're not getting stretched and you're not getting uncomfortable sometimes, I'm not doing it right. A friend of mine put it to me this way. He said, the truth will set you free. But first, it's going to tick you off. The reason that I even say those things about, I'm going to bring truth, but there are going to be times I'm going to take you off. Is simply this, because I will. And the reason that I do it, and you need to hear this, please hear this. It truly is because we love you. It's not because we're trying to build a big church. We're trying to build a healthy church. It's not because we're trying to get a whole lot of people. No, we're trying to get a whole lot of truth. And truth will transform people. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So I, I, I want you to understand something, okay? So please hear the facts. Number one, I'm going to speak truth. Number two, at some point, you're going to get ticked. But here's what's so important. I really hope you'll grab hold of this. And you'll have a little bit of better understanding about the DNA of this church. You have first, you have first, you have first got to know that we love you. They don't, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You need to know first that we love you here. You need to know that your pastor loves you here. And because I love and submitted to God first, I'm going to speak his truth. And I want you to hear his truth. I don't look at my little granddaughter, Cyprus. And I don't yell at her when she's about to run out into the street so I can take away her fun. I do that because I love the little girl. So I need you to know that you're loved here. So that when that time comes and I speak a truth that you go. Tell me if I'm missing this. 
too many times we hear truth and we try to move away from it. A friend tells you truth. Yeah, well, I'm not hanging out with that loser anymore. A counselor tells you truth. Yeah, I'm finding somebody else. A church tells you a truth. We need to find a new place. Know that we love you. And because we love you, we're going to bring you truth. And when that time comes to set your clocks, it's coming. I'm going to tick you off. I hope you'll go back to the first foundation of going, you know what, before I storm out of these doors and say I'm done with this lake country, I hope you'll stop for a second and go. But you know what, I know that pastor loves me. And I hope that the love that you've encountered with the people of this church and the love that you encounter with the pastor here causes you to pause to at least listen to what that truth is being spoken. The truth will set you free. But first it's going to take you off. And we've got to make the decision. Are we going to line up with what our feelings dictate? Will we line up with what the world says? Or will we spend our lives in a journey saying, Father, teach me your ways?